Hey, this is James Rolfe, and you're listening to the Canned Air Podcast. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Canned Air Podcast, your tribute to comics and pop culture. I'm Randy Hardenbrook. I'm Jack Doherty. And uh, joining us tonight, we have actor, playwright, author, Billy Van Zant. Billy, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to talk with us. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Can't wait to talk to you about your career and just everything you've done. I, I mean, it's your IMDb, your playwright list, everything's amazing. I cannot wait to hear more about it. But before we do, Jack, what do we have on the website? If you go to cannedairpodcast.com, you can see show highlights, guest info, listen to the show, follow us on all our social media, become a patron, buy some merch, see some of our YouTube videos, and if you'd like to be a guest and promote your work, send us an email on our contacts page. And if you like what you're hearing and uh, what we're doing, feel free to check us out on Patreon and uh, send us a little bit of money your way and get access to our uh, kind of behind-the-scenes catalog of some uh, content that are only for our patrons, and we've got some pretty fun stuff on there, so uh, definitely support- worth provides content <laughs> definitely uh definitely worthwhile so uh yeah so that's enough of the uh the role here so let's get started with uh, our interview with mr van zandt again thank you so much for joining us sir absolutely again just your amazing career i mean where uh where did you first acquire your love for writing and acting uh started when i was a kid and it started with uh, i love lucy on television really I just I was fascinated by the show, the uh, the timing of the actors and the scripts. Actually, they taught me how to write, and I was always writing. Uh, you know, even as a little kid, I would do I would write write plays for the neighborhood kids. I'd write plays for my grammar school class, my middle school class, my high school class, and uh, so I was just always part of what I did. But I, I mostly wrote so I could perform. I wrote stuff to be in. And that's what, uh, so, so I've, I've always had a couple of, couple of balls in the air at all times. And if one thing doesn't work, you move to the other thing. So it, it just keeps me busy. And that, uh, you have, I believe 23 plays to your name. Is that correct? Five, 25. I just counted it up. I always say the wrong number cause we, we, we never knew what it was. So I, when I put my book together, I had to, I had to finally count them. It was, it's 25 altogether. Understood. And um, being both a playwright and a star of those productions, did you find that difficult or was it, how did that work for you? No, my ego took care of it just. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, well, I, I started writing to give myself something to act in and then I started directing the same shows so nobody would mess up my, my writing. And then I started, Jane and I, um, Jane Milmore and I, uh, my, my writing partner, we started producing the shows so nobody would interfere with the direction. So uh, I've always done a little, little of everything. I've always, I always have a, 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 nobody should ever direct themselves. I'm the first to admit it, but I do it all the time. Uh, but I always have a co-director with me to keep an eye on me. And sometimes I videotape the rehearsals and I, I get a better picture of that. But I've been working you- with the same actors on stage for, God, 40 years or so. So wow. we, we have a shorthand where we all work with each other and uh, it just makes it much easier. Do you find like it throughout that process, are you kind of doing both in sync? Like, would you write and then, you know, practice and act and then kind of change some stuff on the, the All the, the time. Play? All the time. It actually got me ready for television because I was already doing that uh, on a daily basis. We'd rehearse and then I'd rewrite at night, come in the next day. Even even on, you know, opening night, I'd be handing out new pages of, of the script to people and have to memorize it backstage before <laughs> they went on. But... Uh, so when I went into television, you know, after writing two-hour plays, writing a 22-minute sitcom was was nothing for us. We just jumped right in, and uh, they'd give us three weeks to write a script. We'd do it in four days, and then we'd spend the rest of the week playing basketball outside our office. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and then you, you spoke to your, uh, your transition to TV. What was that like uh, between, act, you know, being on stage versus being behind a camera for you? Well, it was rough for me because I, I really thought I was uh, messing up my acting career by taking a writing job on the Bob Newhart show. Um, and I, I, I called my agent and I said, I'm not sure I should do this. It's going to take me, you know, take me out of the acting world for a half, for a year. I don't, you know, 
And my agent never bothered calling me back, which told me I didn't really have much of a career at the time to worry about. <laughs> so I, I took the, the TV writing job. And through the years, uh, with very, very, very small sort of walk-on things, uh, Jane and I would always throw ourselves into the show maybe once a year, two lines here, one line there. And then we'd spend the rest of the year, uh, we'd do our television probably uh, eight months a year. And then we'd go back east uh, to New Jersey, where we're from, and we would do a new play. And I, Jane and I would, you know, we'd act in that. So we sort of, we had the best of both. And then uh, you also had some uh, acting uh, roles on some major films. Uh, you know, you were one of the teens in Jaws 2. You were a Starfleet ensign in Star Trek, the uh, motion picture, Cadet and Taps. What was that like uh, for you as opposed from a, a, excuse me, from a movie perspective versus TV? Well, I did, I did the, uh, the movies before I did TV. So okay. I, I really went from theater to movies and then to TV. But... Um, it was, Jaws 2 was my first, and it lasted 11 months, and it taught me so much, because I knew nothing about film going in. We had nobody in, in show business in our family. My brother was a musician, but he hadn't quite hit yet, you know? Right, right. And I was growing up, and, uh, you know, my father was an you know, ex-Marine uh, engineer, and my mother worked in a doctor's office, so I knew nothing about show business, except for, uh, you know, my, my high school drama teachers and... Uh, community theater, which got me the agent and manager in New York. So when I, when I made the, the move to, to movies, I really didn't know what to expect. Luckily for me, most of the kids in that film, it was their first film. So we were all sort of in it together. Understood. And the, the very first day, Murray Hamilton, who played the mayor, came over to me sitting in the hotel lobby. And I hadn't met, hadn't met the guy before. And uh, just out of the blue, he just turned to me. And the first words he said were, they'll kill you and they won't care as long as they get the shot. <laughs> and that was my introduction to making movies. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of sets you up for a little bit yeah. of terror. And we, we were very naive. We did a lot of stupid stunts that we shouldn't have done. You know, when one boat smashed into the other boat, you know, we, we did that. Nobody told us that we had a choice. So we got on the boat and slam it into that boat over there. Okay. And then we'd slam it into the boat over there. Um, so it was, uh, and then I know when they did the, when the shark ate the helicopter in that movie and the blades went flying, they, they had us sit on the trampoline of the boat and they threw blades at us. So, so we were young and naive, but we did what we were told. Now, I, I do want to kind of hop forward a little bit. Uh, you also had a role in the, uh, the animated comedy series, American Dad. Yeah, I loved doing that. Oh, it was that fun. What was that like going from, you know, being a live action, uh, you know, TV movie uh, to a sound studio for a cartoon? It was, it, I felt like I was, I was coming home, actually. It was kind of, it was so great because it had been so long since I had done anything like that. And um, um, Matt Weitzman, who, uh, who created, uh, one of the creators of the show, I gave him his first job on a Don Rickles sitcom uh, called Daddy Dearest. Mm -hmm. And out of the blue, he called me up and said, I want you to come do this. And so I was Jerry the Dentist in one episode. And, uh, uh, oh, I just blanked on her name. My wife was an Oscar nominee or an Oscar winner, too. Anyway, I had such a ball doing that. I keep, I keep waiting for him to have Jerry, Jerry the Dentist come back again. You know, it'd be kind of fun. <laughs> to keep but, dropping uh, hits, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm not hinting broad, loud enough, I guess. But uh, but it was really it was so much fun, and uh, and my voice is so bizarre anyway uh, that it was it was like it was fitting. I was doing a cartoon. <laughs> On top of all that, you're also an author. Uh, your book, Get in the Car, Jane: Adventures in the TV Wasteland, uh, which is kind of a behind the scenes look at sitcoms, uh, many of which you had created. Um, you have Martin, the Waynes brothers, Suddenly Susan, Daddy Dearest, uh, also some Lucille Ball. Uh, can you speak uh, a little bit on that and kind of... Sure. Sure. I did. Um, I, I put the book together it mostly for... It started out as, a, as a, an essay for my kids. I wanted them... They didn't understand what, what producing a, a sitcom was about. They knew that my theater world because they would come to the theater and sit through the rehearsals. So they knew that whole process but they didn't understand what I did to make a TV show. So I started writing this for them and I had journals that I kept on all the TV shows that I either created or wrote or produced. So I went back and I referenced all those 
And I realized I had some pretty good stories in there. And uh, so every chapter of the book is a different TV show that we worked on. You don't have to read it in order, you know. And uh, the most, it's mostly, uh, mostly stuff from my journals that are just funny stories or gossipy stories. Uh, but through the, throughout the book, uh, you re- a little bit at a time, I didn't hit anybody over the head with it, but you sort of learn my job by the end of the book. And you see all the frustrations you go through and all the hoops you have to jump through to get a TV show on the air. I, I always say, I don't care how bad a television show is. I know what that person had to do to get it on the air. So <laughs> I have more respect for that show than, than other people might. But um, it's been a, it's been fun. I, I, I honestly don't feel like I've worked a day in my life. I've always either been in the theater or in television or in film. I've, I'm proud and ashamed to say this at the same time, but I've never worked outside of show business aside from cutting lawns when I was a teenager. So, <laughs> well, so, it, it, that's awesome. If I need to get another job, I don't know what it is. <laughs> what kind of skills do you have? Well, I, can do I have none. I have, and I, can I have no skills. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to some of those uh, shows that you developed and created and wrote for, um, what is it like for you f- to write for a comedian such as, you know, the Wayans Brothers and Martin Lawrence? Do you kind of write the jokes for them or do you just kind of... Give them a premise and then let them run with it a little bit? Right. Uh, no, my, my job would be to watch whatever... If it's a stand-up comedian, I, I, I study their act enough to know what their character basically is. Right, and, so someone like Andrew Dice Clay, you can kind of let exactly. them do Exactly, you thing. know exactly what you're getting when you, when you get right. Andrew. <laughs> so, um, so you write around that. And uh, the, the difficult part, uh, to be quite honest, is that mo- all these stand-up comedians have been their own writer, producer, director for 10, 20 years. Mm-hmm. And now they you know, come to somebody like me who says, okay, now I'm in charge. I'll tell you what's funny, what's not funny, what's going to work, what's not going to work. So there's always a weird little trust period you have to get through for them to say, okay, I trust this guy. But I think we've, most of the sitcoms we've done have been with stand-up comedians, and I think we've showcased them all pretty well. But we, we write, we definitely write it, and then we are smart enough to listen to the comedian because they know what makes them funny and what doesn't, and it's really not up to me. It's up to me to structure it in a way that, um, that makes sense and to surround them with good actors. Mostly, mostly when you work with uh, standups, I, I surround them with stage actors um, because they really know their craft. And then, you know, you're, 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 you'd be a fool not to listen to the, to the comedian, but there are times where the comedian doesn't know when to shut it off and you have <laughs> to suddenly, you know, that's, that's where Jane came in very handy. She would handle all that. Um, I was going to say, is there a lot of like downtime pretty much because they're, making you laugh too much or going going overboard a little bit no the, the, by the time we're doing all this we're not laughing at all <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just plowing ahead because you, you're always time is time is the enemy on on a tv show um you know one wrong move and the script gets thrown out and suddenly you're weeks behind and you have to catch up we write very fast thank thank god um so we've uh, and i'm and i'm psychotically organized so Going, we usually have about six weeks before the actors come in, where it's just the writers, and we get as far ahead as we can because as the season goes on, you're slowly slipping behind schedule. And that's why on a lot of TV shows, towards the end of the season, you'll see that the episode is written by you know eight people because they wrote it in the room with all the writers sitting around a table, and they because they ran out of time and they had to put something <laughs> on paper. So. Uh, <laughs> But for the, yeah, for the most part, we write it a lot. A lot of times we will not have the comedians come into the writer's room with us. Okay. Uh, a very few amount of people are capable of, of just throwing off their star banner and, and becoming one of the guys, you know, Understood. Uh, Drew, Drew Carey was great at that. I worked on his pilot and um, the Wayans brothers were great for that. Uh, where they would come in the room and they would pitch something, and it was if, if it was funny, it went in the script, and if it wasn't, you basically said it wasn't, and you and you moved on, without having them go, "No, I'm the star of the show, so therefore, <laughs> they didn't, they didn't I get that. final say." Yeah, yeah. Andrew never came in the room. Martin Lawrence only came in the room to threaten to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> if these scripts aren't funnier, I'll kill you. That's what I got a lot of. That's um, amazing. It was hilarious, you know, because he a couple of his friends were on the writing staff. So he'd come in and he'd yell at us, and then he would 
take his you know a friend literally by the collar and throw him <laughs> up against the wall in the hall. They just better be funnier tomorrow, you know that kind of stuff. I can only but, imagine that kind of helps morale and kind of helps break the tension when you guys are up against the deadline as well. Well, we ended up doing a lot. This this uh, I don't know if I ever told anybody this. Whenever Martin would come in and and you know yell at us and and to be fair to him he was trying to make the show better it just didn't do it the right way but he was trying <laughs> he was trying so whenever he'd leave the room instead of working on the scene we were working on we all would write write a scene about where martin comes in and thanks the writers <laughs> <laughs> oh man how uh, as a writer what was your creative or what is your creative process like and how do you handle writer's block oh i don't believe in writer's block at all I fair enough know. I don't, um, and a lot of people give me crap about that. But I, to me, the easiest thing to do is rewrite. Okay. So I always tell somebody on my writing staff, I don't care how terrible your first draft is, just get it out. Because then the next day you're going to look at it and go, this is terrible. But you know what would fix it? I can fix this. This should come out. This should come. And by then you, 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 get, you work through it. I think of a script as sort of a big block of clay, and our job is to just keep trimming away at it until you get the actual statue, you know? That's a that great way of looking at it. Pretty much everything. I mean, if you get stuck doing something, usually if you sleep on it or something like that, you'll come back the next day with refreshed and have yeah. a better idea on how to continue. Yeah, and for, for the same reason, I, I've never... Uh, a lot of shows will work through lunch. They'll order in, and everybody, all the writers sit there. I won't do that. I want everybody to get out and you know, get out of the room and, and relax for an hour. I like to work early. I like to be done early. And uh, when we when we shoot a show, I like to do one take per scene and then move on like it's a play. That's how I Love Lucy did it. That's how Bob Newhart did it. That's how Martin Lawrence did it. Because I don't care what show it is, when, when you nitpick things to death, it's no funnier than it was when it was rough, you know? <laughs> Just right, as, right. And I don't, and I've been on plenty of shows where you stay up till three, four o'clock in the morning working on a script, and nothing you've written at three, four o'clock in the morning is good the next day. It just isn't. <laughs> it's mostly just let's finish this so we can go home, <laughs> you know. But uh, as you're writing some of these sitcoms and stuff like that, do you have like an end goal in mind, or is it, do you kind of write season by season, or you know, is it like okay, well, we got renewed for another season. What are we gonna do? You, well, the smart way to do it is to arc the arc the season. You start sure. with, you know, where are we going to end up, right? And mm -hmm. and if you're the showrunner, you are you're thinking three years at a time. You know, this yeah. is the season where, okay, they're going to get married by the end of this season. By the end of the next season, they're going to have a kid. You know, it's just little weird sort of arcs. And most of the time, you, with rare exception, now I think you work two years as an executive producer, creator of a show. And then you, your contract's up. You move on to something else and somebody else comes in and they try and take your show and, and run with it. So you really, it's a luxury to get more than two years going at a time. Um, I know on Bob Newhart's show, uh, you know, that show started out as a man running a bed and breakfast. And by the time we got on in se season seven, this had been four or five showrunners later the show had turned into Green Acres, which was great for me because I loved Green Acres. <laughs> but, but uh, uh, you know, and, and and the writing staff, the difficult job as a writer, as a writer on a writing staff, is you have to, your job is to imitate the writer who wrote, who created the show. That's your job. Not okay. to be funnier than him, not to take it in a weird direction. You have to write as if you're that person. You got to hear that person's cadence. You got to hear what makes that funny for, for that guy. Or, or woman and you know a lot of times the first couple of years i was doing this i was just biting my tongue because i kept saying to jane you know why aren't they using the thing that i pitched because it was funnier than what they're doing she said it's not your show billy it's not your show <laughs> you know? and when you finally get it to be your show you can see some young writers sh shooting each other looks going you know why isn't he putting my stuff in you know it's the same thing but yeah my, my yeah my job is to showcase the comedian uh the writer's job underneath me is to imitate my writing and then we always have a final pass on it, so we tweak everything the way we want it anyway. And then ultimately, the audience is what tells you whether it works or not. Although I will, uh, I'll preface that. I'll, I'll take that back. I'll say the camera guys tell you what's funny or not because they've seen it all. And when they come in on Thursday, which is the fourth day of your fifth uh, day of shooting, they're hearing the dialogue for the first time. 
if they're not laughing, the show stinks. I'm telling you. <laughs> if they're la- if they're laughing, it's like, oh, good, we got away with this one. This is good. Okay. Okay. Cameraman's the best critic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's true. Working with a uh, a bunch of comedians, I can only imagine there was some backstage pranks and stuff like that going on. Um, were there any memorable moments or anything that you know you thought was very funny or enjoyed throughout your your uh, sitcom career? Well, the funnest for me was w- working with Don Rickles. He would just he was funnier off camera than he was on almost <laughs> half the time. So whenever we would yell cut, we kept the cameras on him and he would just attack people in the audience with his <laughs> and, stuff. and it was great. It was so good that we would trim the show as much as we could and we'd put three minutes of, of footage of him insulting the audience at the end, you know, that kind of stuff. So that was always fun. The Wayans brothers liked to prank uh, to the point where it cost us time and money. They would have a, you know, they would start a food fight in the middle of a scene that there wasn't supposed to be a food fight in. Oh, and no. Then, and then you'd have to go, you know, okay, we need new kind costumes for this we got to clean that up that kind of stuff uh backstage there was no real backstage pranks on new heart no i think we i think they must find me much too serious to, to pull pranks <laughs> i don't know that's that's amazing what's what's next for you mr van zandt what uh what are you working on what's coming down the pike well when we were uh before the world shut down we were touring in our 25th play which is the boomer boys musical which is uh four guys like the rat pack uh, complaining about uh, the changes men go through when they hit a certain age. It's a musical. <laughs> it's really funny. And we were touring that for about two years, and then uh, then the world stopped. So when the, when things open up again, we're just going to continue doing that again. And while um, uh, my writing partner passed away in February unexpectedly. And, oh, I'm uh, sorry to hear that. Year, thank you. And the last year of her life, we really thought this was – just a wrong diagnosis because she was the healthiest person you ever met, you know? And, um, we, she insisted we work two, three days a week right through the end. So we have a lot of half finished projects that I have on a shelf here that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to finish them all. And I cannot wait to hear about them and to see them. I mean, that that's amazing. Thank you. What, uh, what advice would you give for an aspiring writer or actor? I would say, um, if you're an actor, I would go to go to New York and learn the craft before you come out here. Out here, it's very easy to become famous quick and not know what you're doing. Uh, and those people don't last very long. I would say, uh, as an actor, perform in as many things as possible. You know, I don't care if it's a small role, big role, just keep working. The more you do, the more you learn, the better you get. And as far as being a writer, um, just the more, again, the more you do, the better you get. And uh, the most important thing for a writer who wants to go into sitcoms is a, is a thing called a spec script, which is a script you write for free based on whatever TV show you're passionate about. But don't rush that. It's got to be better than anything you've ever read in your life because people will not read you twice. That's mm-hmm. your calling card, that script. And, and if people rush to get it out, so maybe I'll get on a staff this year. And if the script's not good, and then you send a second script, which is fantastic, somebody like me is going to see the name and go, oh, no, I read that guy already. I didn't like him. So make sure that spec script is fantastic. And, um, and the other thing I would say for, for writers and actors is what I've learned through all these years is nobody really knows anything. <laughs> there's, there, there's no set rule of how you get from A to B. You just find your way. Uh, uh, but I think, I think talent, it, it, you got to stick with it because there's a million other people who want the same thing you do, you know. But the more you stick to it and the more you do it, the better you get. And you got to realize that the, uh, there are m- major ups in this business. I recommend it for anybody who really is passionate about it. I've loved my career. But there are also horrible lows where every time a job ends, you think you're never going to work again, <laughs> you know, until right. suddenly the phone rings and it's like, well, what was I, what was I upset about for that month? You know? <laughs> um, so you just uh, surround yourself with people, you know, people you love and uh, family, still everything, you know. Right, and, absolutely. So that was my, my my little words of wisdom. No, that's that's great. Thank you for that. And I uh, wondered I, which was actually better, maybe not easier, but probably the better to go to first would be either Hollywood or New York for to get into acting. Yeah, I, acting. I would say New York. Um, 
sitcom writing, I, I think LA, but I think, uh, you know, I came, I came out here with a bunch of plays under my belt and there is something to be said for youth, you know, um, if you're lucky enough to get on a, on a, a writing staff, you're probably guaranteed, I don't care if you're a good, bad or good or bad writer, you're pretty much guaranteed a seven year career at the least because one show leads to another and then you met this person. And then, and then if you're, you know, you're quite good at what you do, you end up with a, you know, 30, 40 year career. The other thing I would say for actors and writers right now is you have the uh, ability to film something on your telephone. And I would advise people do that. You, you know, there are a lot of web series that are being turned into TV series and they're not expensive to make. You make them for free on your phone. Mm -hmm. And again, as, as an actor, you know, through this pandemic, you've seen a couple of people who, who came out with really funny little bits that they were doing and, and putting online. And now those people have, you know, they have TV specials. And <laughs> so uh, there's, there's, there's a million different avenues to take. And I suggest you try all of them. Well, and, and Mr. Van Zandt, I want to thank you for making us laugh so much over the years. I mean, it's, you know, just looking through everything you've done. I mean, I, I would challenge anybody to find something that they haven't seen or, you know, listened to. Um, I would also like to encourage all our listeners to go to VanZantMillmore.com. Is there any other places we should be directing people to uh, see your upcoming projects and kind of see what's going on with you? Oh, Instagram and uh, Twitter, although I haven't the slightest idea what my handles are. <laughs> but if you, look me, if you look me up, you'll find it. And then on uh, the, the book you can find on Amazon, uh, Get in the Car, Jane, or on Barnes & Noble. I'm always around. It's hard to miss me. <laughs> well, again, sir, I, I want to thank you for taking some time out to talk to Jack and I this evening. And uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Jack. And until next time, I'm Randy Hardenbrook. I'm Jack Doherty. I'm Billy Van Zandt. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. puppy oh no don't run it'll only make things worse what remember you never want to approach a stray dog especially one that's foaming at the mouth get away from the animal as quickly as you can and tell a grown-up and knowing is half the battle G.I. Joe this has been a canned air production 